Hello Penguin Arts, I'm the Baby Penguin and welcome back to Kerbal Space Program Beyond Kerbal. In the previous episode we returned from Heba with our bounty of fusion pellets and we briefly visited the moon of Fust, Kupris and found some interesting ancient ruins there. And it was sort of a bit of a shakedown cruise for our new Excalibur vehicle because honestly I designed it in about 10 minutes. Uh, and that's gonna come back to bite me later on in the episode, having tested it on a body with uh, an atmosphere, I think about 0 0.01 atmospheres thick. Um, so yeah, I didn't really test whether or not it was aerodynamically stable. Spoiler alert, it isn't. <laughs> but anyway, we're having to manufacture ourselves some new carbon dioxide storage tanks. Uh, a lot smaller than the previous ones we had on the Clark, obviously weighing a lot less. Um, but these are just to refuel our IEV Philip Pullman after it lands on each of the bodies. I really should have put a lot more effort into the, the Philip Pullman, um, considering we're going to be using it to land on every single remaining body in the Valentine system. That is correct, we are going to go on a grand tour of this star system. Because, you know, we haven't seen a lot of the planets yet, I want to see everything that Valentine has to offer. See if there are potentially any more colonization candidates in this star system. That would be uh, quite an interesting thing to see, wouldn't it? And, you know, chart the whole thing before the droves of Kerbals begin their grand exodus out here to Fust. So the Clark here just starting its first burn. First of all, we're going to head a little bit further into the star system. And we're actually going to visit Solith, which is a desert planet. A little bit closer in to Valentine, just nicely sandwiched between Fust and Heba. It's actually um, pretty difficult to land on because it has 1.5 Gs of surface gravity. It's a pretty large rocky planet. Uh, and its atmosphere is about half as thick as that of uh, fast. So it's going to be a little bit tricky to land on, uh, but well, you know, with <laughs> the level of technology we have at this point, no challenge is too great. I mean, after I landed on a gas giant, well, landed in the upper atmosphere of a gas giant, um, I don't think anything's really beyond me anymore. That's kind of like my magnum opus. <laughs> I don't think I'm ever going to surpass that, to be honest. Um, so, <laughs> yeah. I am going to talk a little bit about the future of this series, though, because... The install, as all Kerbal installs do when they're this heavily modded and they go on for, well, not even nowhere near this long. I mean, I've been in this install now for almost three years. Well, not necessarily this install, but this save file has gone through multiple versions. It's been using it across three years, multiple version changes, as I said, a number of different mod updates, and yeah, it's starting to show its age. Um, this install is getting very crashy. Uh, the save file is getting a little bit buggy. Uh, I've been having vessels disappearing and the like, um, and I am thinking I might start to bring Beyond Kerbal to a close. But don't panic. Don't worry. I have a plan to bring the series to a sort of natural end. I've got a plan. I think we'll probably go up to about 30 episodes. Uh, and don't worry, we are still going to visit some other star systems, uh, but I'm going to keep that a nice little surprise for you. But uh, yeah, as I said, it'll be about 30 episodes worth. So I think Beyond Kerbal will continue till the end of this year, and then I think we'll uh, we'll call it. But I mean, oof, three years in the same save file, uh, yeah, <laughs> that's, that's probably enough, right? That you gotta you gotta end something at some point. But I will be having not necessarily a series to replace it, but uh, a new Kerbal series, which I'll be starting very soon. It's not even gonna start when Beyond Kerbal finishes. It's gonna be starting. Very, very shortly, actually. I'll have a teaser trailer up in the next few days. It's a new collaborative series with another YouTuber, and it's not going to be a war series. I'm just going to pop those hype balloons before they're even inflated. It's not going to be a war series. Um, I've been talking about it a lot in my Stellaris streams, but I will save the actual premise and everything for the actual teaser. Leave it as a bit of a surprise, but you should expect that in the next few days. I'm getting very excited about it. Uh, I've been chatting to the guy I'm making this with. Um, quite a bit. We've got some pretty big plans. We think it's going to be quite a lot of fun. Anyway, back to the mission at hand. See, the Clark has now arrived at Solith, and it takes a few burns, a few different orbits to get into orbit. Uh, well, into a low circular orbit over Solith, because we want to be in as low an orbit as we can, really. Save as much fuel um, descending down to the surface and getting back up into orbit as possible. As I said, we've got a grand tour to do here, and we don't have to go all the way back 
to fuss to refuel at any point. I just want to basically just fly from planet to planet to planet and plant a flag on every single one of them. It's a bit of a whistle stop tour. Um, we didn't bring a rover or really any, we didn't even put like life support tanks on the uh <laughs> on the lander so yeah that means that the uh of course they'd probably have oxygen and stuff but you know the kerbals can only spend about seven days or so away from the clock so yeah no massive expeditions we're literally just visiting each planet just so i can have a look at them and landing on each of them and planting a flag just so we can say that we have uh, but some of these planets really are rather beautiful andrew did a beautiful job on them although we keep getting this this bug. I think a lot of people have mentioned it in the comments that whenever um, spacecraft are in low orbit around any of the Valentine planets, they're, they're really brightly lit up. And I thought it would be sort of planet shine going nuclear for some reason. And I thought I would tweak some configs. And then I looked and I realized I don't actually have the planet shine mod installed. Um, so I don't know how we're getting planet shine. So that's, you know, light reflected back off of a planet onto a spacecraft. Um, so I think maybe it's a scatterer glitch. I'm not sure. I posed it to my Discord and nobody really had any ideas. It's not something we've experienced in the um, Archangel system. So it seems to be unique to Extrasolar. Uh, I don't know if it's because Extrasolar was not like comprehensively updated for the latest version of Scatterer. Scatterer had some pretty major updates and I've had to actually get Games Links' help to change some of the Scatterer configs for some of these planets. Uh, to actually get them to work, mainly just because Andrew, uh, who works on Extrasolar, well, I should say worked on Extrasolar, sort of left KSP behind, which is fair enough, um, but Extrasolar is no longer really supported unless I have a, a game-breaking issue. I can go message him on <laughs> Discord and ask for his help. But uh, that doesn't stop us admiring the beauty of these planets. Uh, as we are descending through the atmosphere in a giant ball of superheated plasma, and uh, as you can see, the spacecraft is not aerodynamically stable. We're having to fire the engine just to try and maintain control and uh, struggling to slow down fast enough with the strength of the gravity and how thin the atmosphere is. Uh, we are descending pretty fast into the atmosphere. You'll probably notice we did a very, very gentle re-entry profile. We did pretty much the most gentle re-entry profile we could do, but uh, thankfully we have a nose-mounted parachute to bring the nose of the spacecraft back uh, and stop us just plowing into the ground at full speed. And there we are, getting our Kerbal out to go survey the barren surface. I actually tried to take his helmet off, um, and although the atmosphere is breathable, it's apparently too hot for him to take his helmet off. I think the surface temperature is something like 60 degrees centigrade, something roasting like that. I don't know what that is in Fahrenheit. It's probably, what, like 130 Fahrenheit? Something around that sort of realm. I, I know I have a lot of American viewers, but <laughs> I'm not familiar with, um, <laughs> with Imperial units, unless it's miles. It's weird. The UK has like a a really strange fusion of Imperial and metric units. We are slowly moving over to entirely metric, um, but there are certain certain areas in which we're stuck with Imperial pretty much, mainly just because all like the motorway signs and stuff are all in miles. Um, but most cars, well, all cars manufactured now have kilometers per hour and miles per hour um, on their speedos. Um, but all the road markings and everything are all in miles. I think at some point we will completely transfer over to metric, but uh, I'm not sure. We've got a weird sort of fusion at the moment. We had a strange problem here uh, with the main engine. It kept deciding it wanted to burn our liquid fuel. I don't know why. I kept changing it back to burning carbon dioxide, which is much more efficient. Um, but it kept deciding, no, I don't want to burn carbon dioxide. I want to burn liquid fuel. We had to, <laughs> well, we had to turn it off and on again. And then that seemed to fix the problem. Um, this fusion aerospike is... A little problematic. Um, it actually has a very slightly offset center of thrust. So I actually positioned it directly in the center of the spacecraft and yet it seems like the thrust of the spacecraft isn't quite going through the center of mass. Um, the model seems to be uh, slightly out of whack um, and I keep like reloading saves and stuff and for some reason the engine plume is just firing even though the engine isn't on. It seems to be quite a quite a buggy engine. Um, it may well have been fixed in more recent versions of uh, KSB Interstellar though. I know Freethinker is one of the, I think he is the lead developer on 
KSP Interstellar, who's helped me a lot with getting to grips with uh, Interstellar Extended, because it is a very, very complicated mod. He keeps sort of begging me to, <laughs> to update Interstellar, um, but honestly, like, I've got a stable install. I, I don't really want to screw with it and have to spend time on it, um, on updating various different mods and finding out what does and doesn't work. Um, <laughs> I know it's been upsetting him a little bit, like, ah! You know, it's sort of... Yeah, <laughs> Rekik is pride as a mod developer because I'm sure many of these issues have been fixed and he's added a lot of cool stuff into the mod. Um, it's it's very, very well supported actually, um, Interstellar Extended. It's a pretty massive, pretty massive project. And it is rather impressive, but uh, it's a little overwhelming to new users. I, I keep thinking, especially since I've now had so much experience with it, um, and since I have a direct line to the lead developer on it, I should maybe make a tutorial series on Interstellar. A lot of people have asked me to make a tutorial series on USI, and I do understand that because USI is, is very complicated. Um, but USI has very good documentation in game, and also Mark Thrym did an amazing tutorial series. I've already mentioned it in a previous episode, but if you want a tutorial series on USI, well, go watch Mark Thrym. Like anything I did, like. Would, <laughs> wouldn't be any better than the Mark Thrym series, right? Um, so I couldn't really hope to surpass that. But with regard to KSB Interstellar, there isn't really a decent tutorial series, you know, bite-sized chunks. Like, you've got, like, two-hour-long live stream videos of people teaching it to you, and it's it's not particularly helpful. Um, and a lot of things in Kerbal Space Program and Interstellar Extended, I don't know why I just said the full name of it, but a lot of <laughs> things in it aren't fully explained. You have to sort of just launch vessels and, you know, trial and error a lot of these things. Um, a lot of the, like, basic mechanics are documented in the KSpedia in-game. Um, but there are a fair few mechanics, especially like reactor fuel type and stuff, which uh, which are rather poorly explained. So maybe if, if you're interested in seeing that, I might actually make that uh, in the foreseeable future. Anyway, after our brief, uh, <laughs> our very brief stay at Solith, we're heading out into the outer solar system. And this is Mir. It actually reminds me of man's planet from uh, from the film Interstellar. Uh, it's got a very thick atmosphere and I believe about 1G of gravity, although Man's Planet had, I believe, like 80% gravity. I've watched that film far too many times. It, it's a flawed film, I know, but I, I love it. <laughs> I love it so much. But uh, yeah, it is a little frozen snowball, which also actually has oxygen. Um, although this one's atmosphere is not breathable. Uh, I actually did. Um, I used the KSPI uh, atmosphere analysis thing, and it actually contains a lot of ammonia, which is exactly what man's planet contained. I don't know if that's just a complete coincidence, but uh, yeah, anyway, the atmosphere is toxic, uh, even though it does contain oxygen, so we would technically be able to run jet engines on this planet. Um, but, uh, but yeah, we didn't obviously bring any jet engines because we have fusion engines, which of course can use the intake atmosphere of any planet, not just ones with oxygenated atmospheres. But Solith and Mir, I guess, would be colonization candidates. I mean, Solith has... I don't believe it has any oceans. Mir does have oceans, and of course it's absolutely covered in ice, so I guess it would be the more promising candidate, but at the same time, its atmosphere is toxic. So, yeah, neither of them are particularly hospitable. Uh, so I think we might just stick with Fust. You see here, just uh, doing our usual little burn using our normal liquid fuel oxidizer engines, and then switching over to that main fusion aero spike, which of course spews out huge amounts of deadly neutron radiation, so we can't be firing it near any of our spacecraft. Of course, a few people have been asking me um, if that's role play or something. They're like, oh, you know, you're saying, ah, we can't fire the engine near settlements and stuff, and then you use it to land, and, you know, oh, that doesn't make sense. I, I'm not doing the whole neutron radiation thing as a, as a role play. It's an actual interstellar mod mechanic, right? <laughs> if you fire this engine without the radiation safety um, enabled near another spacecraft with Kerbals in it, you will kill all of them in seconds. It's an actual mechanic uh, as part of the mod, which is pretty cool. A lot of the uh, fusion engines have uh, have that same mechanic. The Daedalus engine is the same as well. So yeah, you know that little shot in the uh, KSB2 trailer where you've got the two little Kerbals waving at the Daedalus engine as it activates? I think even Nate Simpson, creative director of <laughs> KSB2, admitted, yeah, they would be toast. <laughs> they would be pretty much in incinerated. 
It's not a good place to be when uh, when you're starting up a giant <laughs> fusion engine. Anyway, once again taking a very gentle re-entry profile, although since the atmosphere is a lot thicker and also goes a lot higher, um, our re-entry is a lot more gentle, uh, deceleration a lot more gradual, so we don't really have too many problems during this one. Again, I wish I'd just stuck some grid fins on this spacecraft. Like a, a few grid fins, even maybe just taking off those fins at the bottom. And that would have solved all our problems. Just move the center of lift back above it, uh, the center of mass, and uh, it would have made entering a planet's atmosphere significantly easier. But uh, no, with the position of those fins, yeah, it just keeps wanting to turn around. Of course, it makes it very stable when it's being launched. Um, but considering this is supposed to be landing on a lot of bodies with thick atmospheres, yeah, not the best design. Uh, as I said, <laughs> maybe should have spent longer on it. But alas, the nose-mounted parachute saves the day once again. So we just lose the parachute and it manages to pull the nose round. And uh, there we go. We can use our Fusion Aerospike to bring us to a nice gentle stop. Once we're through the cloud lower, thankfully, unlike Man's Pie, we don't have any frozen cloud that we could <laughs> crash into. Imagine a mod that added that. That'd be pretty terrifying. I know Games Links' Beyond Home Pack actually adds terrain scatters that you can crash into and land on. So clouds that you could crash into isn't exactly beyond the realm of possibility. Uh, but <laughs> whoever creates that mod... Yeah, uh, that would be that would be truly cursed. Imagine that, like a, a cursed KSP where <laughs> it has clouds you have to actually dodge. <laughs> Otherwise you crash into them. That would be quite something. Anyway, once again, just planting, uh, planting a flag, taking a little look around, taking some pictures, maybe some selfies on this rather barren field of ice, and then blasting back up into orbit with the power of that beautiful Z-Pinch Aerospike engine. Hopefully we won't get back up into orbit and find that a crazy astronaut has tried to dock to the Clark without using the docking computer and depressurize the airlock and sent the Clark into a spin. Uh, forcing us to make a very dangerous docking maneuver. Although such a maneuver with the Clark would probably be impossible considering I don't think any of its docking ports are directly underneath its center of mass. So yeah, fingers crossed we don't have to deal with that. Uh, I did actually do that docking maneuver in my old KSP Interstellar series which is quite the throwback. That went from what, like 2014 to 2015. I mean, I'm not that proud of those videos really anymore, but people still watch them and say they enjoy them. So I don't know, there must be some kind of merit to them. I remember like I started off that series as basically just, you know, just exploring another star system. Uh, very similar to this series in, in effect. Uh, and <laughs> then the install got really unstable. So I introduced some story elements just so I could, I could bring it to a close, which to be fair is similar to what I'm doing here. Like any, <laughs> Anytime you really want to bring us, bring a career mode to a to a close, you really want to introduce a few story elements, like a bit of a, a final goal, uh, so you can bring it to a sort of satisfying ending. Because nobody wants to just land on a planet and be like, you know what? Yeah, I think I'll call it here. Like, you know, a series going on this this long, I want to have something satisfying, um, a reason to watch through all of it. And I have got some plans, as I said. Um, I've got a sort of roadmap for the series. I'm I'm really quite excited. I hope you guys are gonna like. Uh, the direction that I take it. But don't you guys worry, we're not going to be like transitioning into an entirely story focused <laughs> series or anything. Like, it is still going to be, first and foremost, just a, just a fun interstellar career mode series, just with a few story elements, I think, to, uh, to liven things up a bit. I think that's sort of a fun direction to take things in, a nice little balance to strike. Anyway, a site for sore eyes as the IEV Pullman returns to the Clark. Maybe with a few uh, a few handfuls of ice they can put in their drinks. And uh, there we go. Have have their cocktails on the rocks, which is just the way that Ted likes them. <laughs> As we blast out to the final planet in the Valentine system, Lomina, which is an ice giant right on the edge of the system. Although on the edge of the system is... Uh, a bit of a misnomer. It's not that far away, as I said. It's still <laughs> within the orbit of Eve, if you <laughs> compare it to the Archangel system. So really not a particularly long trip for us to head out there and land on all of its moons. We're not going to be landing on Lomina itself. I've, Yeah, landing on one <laughs> gas giant is, is more than enough for me. Anyway, thank you for watching, everyone. I've been the Beardy Penguin, and I will see you all next time.